Okay, you can hear me now, right? Well, thank you. There's a lot of life in this house. Amen? Amen. Well, yeah, I'm going to count down clock, so we're going to get started right away. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. I want to talk to you today about position for purpose. Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 3, it says, And the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Amen. Amen. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight a highway in the desert for our God. Every mountain will be brought low and every valley raised up. The crooked places made straight and the rough places smooth. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. How many want to see the glory of God? How many want to see God's glory manifested in their family, in their community, in their church? We want to see the glory of God. Man, if there was ever anybody that would seen the glory of God, it was Moses. I mean, just think about when he's taking out the children uh, of Israel out of bondage of, of Egypt and, and seeing the miracle after miracle after miracle. And then he says to God, show me your glory. If there's anybody that had seen it, it was Moses. Amen? Do we have that hunger today? Are we ready for the glory of God? You know, we're hearing about the revivals that are taking place across the U.S. and in, in campuses, college campuses. God is moving in incredible ways. But you know what? Before the glory of God manifests, there is a preparation stage. I'm asking you today, are you ready and are you prepared for God's glory? Amen. Amen. You know, it's so easy to dismiss that preparation stage. It's just seen as some kind of un, unspiritual activity, some work of the flesh. But you know what? Preparation is an act of faith. The Bible says, by faith, Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his family. You know, that preparation phase, it's so easy uh, to forget. And now, I just want to quickly make a quick plug for, for Daniel uh, and Hesper, who took us over to their house, or, or served us an incredible meal. Did you already talk about this? And I, I'm sporting some really cool Nikes, aren't I, man? This is uh, from Super Dan the Shoe Man, man, <laughs> gave me these. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know what? They had us over for a meal, and we had steak prepared two different ways. I mean, one was like just the normal way you do it, but the other was this, what, some French word, sous vide. I mean, I don't even know what it means. But I mean, there was, and as we're talking about how awesome the food is, I mean, there was a leg of lamb, there were steaks prepared two different ways. There was fried deviled eggs or something. I mean, there, it was incredible spread, and we're talking about this. And they said, oh, yeah, and she was preparing it all day. And then as we're talking more, even the day before, she had been preparing this meal. You know what? There's something so powerful with preparation. Amen. Because you can prepare and prepare and prepare. But then at the end, I'm telling you, the glory came down. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was some good throwing down. Amen. We often forget that. You know, one of the great uh, coaches uh, of the Hoosiers, record-holding coach, basketball coach, he made a statement. He says, the key is not the will to win. Everybody has that. It's the will to prepare to win that is important. It's so easy to overlook that preparation phase. You know, we want to see God show up in the miraculous. We want to see God show up in the supernatural. But we've got to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. Exodus chapter 40. There's a whole, this whole chapter in Exodus chapter 40 is God giving instructions to Moses about how to prepare the tabernacle and the tent of meeting. And it goes on, if we're to read the whole chapter, and I don't have time for that, but it, it tells him how to set it up. It tells him where to put the Ark of the Covenant, where to place the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant, bring a table in and where the table goes and what gets put on the table and where the candle stand stands and where the candle goes, and where the bread is put, and, and just so many details, where the water basin's put. And then it says, and even Aaron and the sons, I want you to dress them, wash them, dress them, anoint them, consecrate them, let everything be done holy. There's just the whole chapter goes in great detail, all the way from verse 1 down to verse 33. And then verse 33, it says, and then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar and put the curtain in the entrance to the courtyard in Moses, and then it says at the end of that, verse 33, it says, and so Moses finished the work. Next verse, verse 34, and then it says, then the cloud covered the, of, of, of the, ta the tabernacle, 
of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Next verse, and it says, and Moses could not enter the meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord had filled the tabernacle. You see, all the preparation was leading up for God to pour out his glory. Do we want to see the glory? Do we want to see God's glory in our life and in our family? We've got to recognize the importance of that preparation phase. Preparation comes before the manifestation. Preparation comes before the multiplication. If you have your Bibles again, let's go over to John chapter 6. It says, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to them to test him. Uh, he said it to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. Verse 12, so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the barley loaves that were, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then the men, and then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, they said, truly, the prophet who has come, this is the prophet who has come into the world. Man, we've all heard about this awesome miracle. Jesus feeds 5,000 people from five loaves of bread and two, two fish and five loaves of bread. I mean, what they had, even, even the disciples said, what is this among so many? But you know what? When you take what you have, no matter how small it is, and you prepare with what you already have, then the glory of God can manifest. You know, we don't have everything that it takes. As we took on this heritage house, we don't have what it takes to run 42 kids, much less 100 kids. Overnight, we took on responsibility of 42 kids. We didn't have it. But you know what? As we begin to prepare, God began to bring his glory. As we begin to step forward, out of nowhere, somebody added another $1,000 to our monthly support, just like that. God just started moving in his glory. You know what? Preparation opens the door for God's glory to manifest. Here we see that what they had was not enough to feed all these. There was a great need. Sometimes there's a great need in your family, and what you have is not enough. Take what you have and begin to prepare. What did Jesus do? He said, make the people sit down. It says in another passage, another um, book, I think it's in the book of Mark, it tells them they sat down in groups of 50s and 100s. So Jesus, first thing, when he sees this great need and that what they have is so small, what he does is he's getting ready to do a miracle. How does God do this miracle? Does he tell, does he say, okay, we're gonna pray and before your eyes this food is gonna multiply and explode into hundreds of loaves of bread? No, he says, make the people sit down. Begin to organize. And he put them in groups of 50s and 100s. And as they were organized and they were prepared, then he begins to distribute it out to the 12 disciples. And it says they begin to spread out the food and they begin to give it and give it and give it and give it. And before long, everybody had eaten. It was a miracle. But it started with the preparation. You see, organization comes before the multiplication. And the preparation phase comes before the manifestation. Do we want to see the glory of God in our lives? We've got to be ready to prepare. In 2007, we were privileged to host one of the, the, the first ever mass evangelism crusades in Niger. Now, Niger is a Muslim country. It's not like some of the other countries in Africa, like Nigeria, where I grew up, or even Ghana or southern African nations, where there's a pretty strong percentage of Christianity. Well, in Niger, Danette said 95% plus. I'm saying 98%. It's pretty much all Muslim. And in a country like Niger, not many crusade speakers are coming. But we were privileged to host Richard Roberts from Oral Roberts Ministries for the first ever mass evangelism crusade. You know what? There was one year. He gave us a manual. One year we had to prepare. So for one year, we're preparing. Now, this country's never experienced. We had to gather the pastors together. They've never even seen mass evangelism in Niger. It's not like those other countries. So we're, we had to meet with them, and we had to go through this manual. In fact, as we're doing the preparation, they asked the, the, the discussion of what were they going to call the, the crusade or the rally. And, and one of the, the national pastors said, well, let's call this national evangelization campaign. And my father, who was in charge of the budget, he said, what Muslim's going to come to that? He said, we're going to call this miracle healing rally. 
And so because he was in control of money, yes, we called it Miracle Healing Rally. Praise God. But it was a year of preparation from everywhere, from the banners to the signboards to the television and the advertising on radio, from the networking of buses to get crowds to the setting up of the fields, the generator and the backup generator to the backup generator. I mean, we did one year of preparation, preparing for this big, not only preparing the logistics, but even preparing the people, the churches, we worked with 90 churches to get them to mobilize together in the capital city for the first ever mass evangelism crusade. But you know, they had never even seen this. In fact, the very night, opening night of the crusade, a group of pastors had come in from the villages and, and they sent somebody up. And I'm up on the platform getting ready to introduce Richard Roberts to come and do this first meeting and and that first night we had 10,000 the crowd had gathered in about 10,000 later by the last night we had 30,000 it's the first ever evangelism crusade of that level in Niger and as as I'm standing there getting ready to introduce Richard one of the pastors comes and asks me he says why the pastors are complaining they're saying why did we call this miracle healing rally and behind the platform there was a big Banner that said, uh, Attendez votre miracle, which is expect your miracle. He says, why did we name it Miracle Hearing Raleigh? Why do we have expect your miracle on the back? He says, this is going to be a great shame for all the Christians in Niger if there are no miracles. You see, that was the mindset of where the people were at. I'm telling you that first night, after one year of preparation, we'd been preparing and putting everything in place, and then Richard got up and he preached the gospel. And then it got to that moment where he's going to begin to pray for the sick and he's going to begin to call out healings. And I remember as, as he stood up and began to pray and all, all the pastors were asked to come and stand and we stood by him. We were all in a line along the altar and we're standing there. And I remember that day we're just looking and he's calling out, you know, every blind eye open and every lame begin to walk and every spirit of infirmity come out. And, and, as he's, and he's saying these things and we're just looking. We're, I'm thinking one year of preparation. What's going to happen? And I'm looking around and and all of a sudden, oh, the glory. All of a sudden, out from one side, they begin to shout, there's a miracle, there's a miracle. And all through the crowd, they begin to cry out, miracle, miracle, miracle. That first night of that rally, Richard said, is the most miracles on a first rally night that he's ever experienced. The glory of God fell down. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes you can think, man, you've been in preparation, you've been in preparation, all this organization, is this really a spiritual thing? I'm telling you, it's an act of faith. Preparation. Man, today, we saw the glory of God in the worship. And I was sitting there looking at the, the people on the instruments and, the, and the, those that are singing, and I know that represents a lot of preparation. Not only those singers that got together to learn the words and to, to learn their parts and how to sing and the timing and the rhythm, and everything, but then you look at the instruments. These people for years have been playing these things, and they were all preparing for this morning when we begin to worship God. And the glory came down. The preparation comes before the manifestation, and the organizing before the multiplication. God wants to give us miracles, and what we have may not be everything we need, but our God is a God of preparation. You know that even before we sinned, God already had a plan, and he was prepared how he was going to save us. You know, he had a whole plan in place from, from the time that he cut covenant with Abraham so that he could legally have a right to come to, to, to giving the law through Moses that we would know that we needed a Savior, to, to every prophet that came telling us about the coming of the Messiah, to every festival, to every law given. It was all a preparation right up even till John the Baptist came, the forerunner, the preparer for Jesus himself. You see, God is a God of preparation. Even the suddenlies of the Bible had been prepared and planned. We hear about in Acts chapter 2, all of a sudden, a sound of a mighty rushing wind filled the house and they all begin to speak in tongues and as fire fell on them and the glory of God. But you know what? Peter gets up and says, and this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Come on. Even the suddenlies of the Bible had been prepared. Preparation. Don't discount the preparation. Our God is a God of preparation. When he wanted to save Israel from the famine that was coming, he took Joseph and made him prepare for seven years. Man, maybe you're in a preparation stage and you're not seeing it. That preparation is a positioning. That preparation is a positioning. You know, we all, we all need to make sure that we are truly prepared. You know, many of Jesus' parables are all dealing with preparation. I love the parables. And, and, and just, just one quick parable. Uh, we, we know the parable of the ten 
virgins and they have their lanterns. And they all show up that day to welcome the bridegroom with their, with their lanterns. But you know, the bridegroom delays. It says the bridegroom delays and he doesn't show up. And, and it starts to get dark and then they actually fall asleep. And then when they realize it's gotten dark, they wake up and they say they go to light their, their lanterns. And only five of the ten have oil in their lamp. And they have light. And the others say, well, give me some oil. They say, well, no, you go get your own oil. So they go and looking for their oil. And the bridegroom comes. And only the five that were prepared go in. You know what? Sometimes today we think we're all prepared. We got our lantern. Man, we're showing up with church carrying that big old Bible. Yeah, and we're coming in. But you know what's on the inside? Are we prepared? Is our heart prepared? We've got to make sure this isn't just something to be seen by others. Are we prepared for the day that's coming when Jesus is coming for us? Are we preparing a way for the Lord to show up in his glory? Are we ready for that? Preparation. Let's go to 2 Kings. And I, I'm cruising fast because last week I preached, and I, I was telling somebody I preached for an hour and uh, 20, 10, 15 minutes. So, hey, I'm on a clock, and I'm with you. Say amen. Give me some encouragement, guys. All right. 2 Kings chapter 4. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that the, your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And just sometimes when you're in a great need, what you have in the natural is not enough. Maybe some of you are facing some situations that what you have is not enough. But what does he do? He gives her instructions of how to prepare. And it says, so Elisha said to her, uh, uh, verse 3, then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. But, and, and when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, and then pour into all these empty vessels and set the full ones aside. Verse 5, so when she went in from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. I want you to see something here. Now, again, just like, just like the feeding of the 5,000, what they had wasn't enough. But Jesus said, begin to prepare. I'm getting ready to do something. Here we see this woman that's the widow woman that is in great need, they're ready to take her son's way, but what she has is not enough. But the man of God says, begin to prepare. Go gather empty vessels. Go in and begin to pour the small jar. And we've all heard the miracle. I know that. And so we're in. She shuts, the, shuts herself into the door. She begins to pour, pour from a small jar into a vessel, into a bottle. And the first one is full. It's a miracle. It says, bring another one. Second bottle full, third bottle full. She goes on, 10 bottles, 20 bottles, 100 bottles full. Bring me another one. Son says, oh, there's no more. And the oil ceased. You see, the glory of God, the supernatural flow of his power is going to continue to the level of your preparation. If she had gathered a thousand bottles, she would have had a thousand bottle of miracle. But if she only gathers 100 or only gathered 10, some of you are just gathering a few thinking, this is all I need. God wants to use you in an incredible way, and he wants to pour out his glory upon you. But let's prepare for the big ones. Amen? God wants to position us. My last point in this message, that is a whole other series of scriptures, so I'm not closing yet. I still got some time. Amen? Amen? Preparation positions you. I started out telling you, my message is about being positioned for purpose. We all have a call of God and a purpose for our life. Are we preparing for that purpose? Preparation positions you for what God has. I want you to go to Habakkuk. Habakkuk or Habakkuk, however you want to say it. Verse 1, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. And then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. And make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Here we see Habakkuk. He says, I will set myself on the rampart. I will put myself in my watch, in my position, and I'll wait to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. I mean, he was prepared. He was not only in position physically, he was prepared how he was even going to give an answer. 
And he put himself there, and then as he's in position, prepared, God begins to speak to him. Man, how many want to hear from God? So many times we, we get going about our business, we're so busy, we're not even hearing what God has for us. we got to get in position. Sometimes there's those steps of preparation. Get prepared and get in position. And then God spoke to him, said, write the vision down. God shows him a vision. The vision didn't come until he prepared himself. Some of us are looking, what does God have for my life? Oh, why, this person seems to know what he's doing, and this person seems to know what he's doing, but, but I want to know, what's the vision of God for my life? Well, have you put yourself in position? Have you prepared? Are you in church? Are you in the word? Are you spending time? Have you positioned yourself and prepared to see the vision that God has for you? We've got to prepare the way. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. We've got to be in position. Jesus said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He said, you don't light a candle and put it under the bushel, but you put it on the stand. Because when it's in its position, when it's in its place, it can have a great impact. God has something great for all of us. We got to get in position. We got to be prepared. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. This, whole, this chapter is where God introduces. God's getting ready to release the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And he's getting ready and he's giving instructions. They've already been through uh, the other nine plagues and Pharaoh continued to hard his heart and refused to let the Israelites go. And it's coming up to this chapter right here where it's getting ready for the Passover. And so the scriptures we're about to read is, is God telling Moses how to prepare the Israelites for the Passover. And there was very... Very specific instructions of how they were to prepare for that night. Verse 7, it says, and they shall take some of the blood. You know, at first it give a lot of details of how you choose the right lamb. And then when you've chosen, it says, then you, you, you're to kill it at twilight, specific time. And it says, you'll take some of the blood and you'll put it on the two doorposts and on the lintels of the house where they eat it. And then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat. Do not eat it raw nor boiled in water. Nor, uh, but roasted in fire, its heads and its legs and its entrails. Let none of these remain until the morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn in the fire. So Moses, God gives Moses all these detailed instructions, not only how to select the lamb, how to prepare the lamb that they're going to eat, and, and then how to put the blood on the lamp. He's preparing them for the Passover. And then it says, even gives them instructions how they're to eat it. It says in verse 11, and thus you shall eat it. He's telling them how they're actually supposed to eat it. It says, you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I remember when I first read this, I got convicted. Because I know how I like to eat <laughs> my meal, my dinner. Okay, now... In our house, when we're raising our kids, we always had a meal together at lunchtime. Get back from Bible school, we all ate together as a family, and that's just how we did it. But I remember in my, uh, then at dinner time, we just sort of, everybody kind of gets their food and we eat in our TV room. And in the TV room, and everybody knows this, there's a special chair that's my chair. It's a recliner. <laughs> it's got a lever here, boom, the feet are up. Like to take my shoes off. I'm not going to take these special Super Dan shoe man shoes off, but takes the shoe, I take the shoes off, unbuckle the belt. Come on, guys, you know, when you're getting ready to throw down, you, you loosen it up. You get in position <laughs> with the remote control right by the side, and man, this is, this is how I like to eat my dinner. So when I read this, I got a little convicted. He said, this is how you eat the meal when God's getting ready to do something. He says you're going to have your shoes on your feet, your belts tightened around your waist, your staff in your hand. You're not reclining. You're standing up. Well, your staff in your hand. You're standing up, and you're eating this in haste because you're in position for God's getting ready to do something. They're getting ready to be released out of bondage. They're standing up, and they're ready. They're prepared, and they're in position for what they're going to do for God. But you know what? Like me, a lot of times, the church, this is their position. Shoes are off, belts open, and God's saying, come on, I need you to ready. I need you in position, and we're out of position. We got to be prepared. After Jesus had 
fed the 5,000. He said, gather up everything that remains. And he says, gather up the fragments that remain. There's a key there. He says, let nothing be lost. You know what? So, so, so often when you are living a life out of position, you're not prepared and you're not organized, you feed 5,000, there's no way you're getting any food back. In fact, we've done feeding programs in Niger, and man, half the food ends up wasted, scattered on the ground. But when you're prepared, Jesus had them sit down. He had them organized. Then he, the miracle began to flow, but they were good stewards, and nothing was lost. You know, we may have missed it, and we may have been out of position, but you know what? Jesus said, gather up the fragments that remain. And I believe today we can gather up the fragments that remain, and nothing will be lost. One last story as I'm closing out my message today. In the year uh, 2000, Niger had never experienced church burnings. Now, since then, it's happened quite a bit. But in 2000, the church was so insignificant that we were not considered a threat at all by the Muslims. And we were on the radio preaching, and because of that, it created some animosity. And one Thursday morning, out of the blue, uh, a crowd of about 500 Muslims came rushing into our Bible school compound with sticks and knives and fire. And our Bible school students fled for their life. They burned the church, burned the dormitory, incredible amounts of destruction. I mean, it was bad. I, I showed up right in the midst. I was supposed to be teaching, but something, the schedule, we changed, and I actually was teaching the next hour. I show up, and the place is on fire. Everybody's run away. And I, I walk into the midst of this, and, and first of all, I called everybody back, and I said, come on, I calling over the wall, and the, 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 the mob had since moved on, gathered everybody together, and I began to pray. I said, let's pray. In that time, is year 2000. I didn't have a very good house at all. So I had an interpreter, and I started praying. I said, God, thank you that nobody was hurt in this attack, and we just thank you for, for, for rescuing and saving us through this. And then I said, and God, I, I just pray that you would bless these people that have done this. And my interpreter was like, excuse me, I'm not understanding what you're saying. I said, just in, God bless these people. Excuse me, I'm not understanding. Just say it. It's hard enough for me to say it. <laughs> But we prayed blessing on them. Uh, the national TV came in. I mean, we had interviewed by BBC and VOA, put, put the story on. But, but the national Niger news came in and filmed us and filmed me to the point that months later, people recognized my face and said, I saw what they did to your church. And I saw everything. And, and these are Muslims saying this. And, and they said, but I was wondering, when you were being interviewed on the television, why were you smiling? You know, I was smiling because I knew, man, we must be getting through. If they're going to attack us like that. And God gave us favor. We were, being, we were being stopped by the police, and they recognized us and say, now, do you have some information about what you believe? Oh, you're, you're, you're asking me to preach to you? For sure, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I, I say that whole story. Share that story with you because at that time in 2000, it had never happened before. Nobody was prepared. Our wall was only, you know, six feet high. Uh, there was just some flimsy kind of uh, gate that they could just break through and come in. As a result of that attack, we raised money, and God just touched the hearts of people across the, the nations. And we were able to build back our Bible school bigger and better and the church. And when it came to the wall... That used to be six feet, now it's 15, and there's iron, there's steel stuff across, the uh, spikes across the top, and our gate is two-ply steel gate with an IPN beam that goes across the back, and even a vehicle's not getting through that. Amen? Almost three, I think three times since 2000, we have been attacked at that same location, but they've never gotten in. In fact, in the year, amen, in the year... 2015, there was 72 churches burned in Niger in two days. Is a, a reaction from Charlie Hebdo thing that had taken place in Paris where they depicted a, uh, Muhammad in a cartoon figure. And it created a lot of issues in Muslim countries. And they attacked in Niger 72 churches. And they came in our city. Our church was the only one they attacked because we're the big one in the city. And they came to our gate. And they said there was more than 500 there. And they were at that gate for four to five hours trying to get in, and they couldn't. They just were throwing stones, but they couldn't break in because we were prepared. When it happened in 2000, we lost so much. But you know what? Now we're, now we're, we're prepared. And we're in position, no matter what the enemy's going to throw at us, we're ready to do what God called us to do. You know, if you, God wants you to, 
Be prepared and ready to do what he's called you to do. And no matter what the enemy's going to throw at you, no matter how he's going to try to scatter it, when you're prepared, you're going to be able to pick up the pieces and get to a higher level. I, I want to challenge you as I close out my message. I want to I, I I ask you to put on your shoes, if you don't have your shoes on. <laughs> I want you to tighten your belt, and I want you to stand up with me. And I want you to be in position. So will you stand up? Stand up in position. And I, wanna, I want a response for three areas. The first area is maybe you're here today and you know you're not prepared. You're unprepared. Jesus is saying we need to be prepared. And the Bible tells us that he'll come like a thief in the night. And if we're not prepared, we're, met, we're left behind like those that, that had lamps but no oil on the inside. If that's you here today and you know you're not prepared, if Jesus was to come today and you're not prepared and you're not ready, that's the first group I want to talk to. Second group of a response is maybe you're out of position. You know where you, you, you know those people that they're always just in the right place at the right time? You say, how can they always be in the right place at the right time? Because they're prepared. Maybe you're out of position and just you feel like you're missing every opportunity. You're losing opportunities. You're losing things that God's giving you, but you can't seem to maintain it because you're out of position. You know, the the word says, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight a highway. Every valley will be raised and every mountain low, every crooked way. Maybe we've got some mountains in our life. Maybe there's some obstacles that have pushed us out of place. We can't really stay on the path that God has for us because we've gotten out of position. Maybe those mountains are some unforgiveness in our life. Maybe there's anger issues. Maybe there's some things you're blaming others. Maybe it's valleys. Maybe there's some anxiety and depression. Things that you just know you need to deal with. If you're out of position today because of any, maybe some crooked things going on. Maybe your life's been rough, and and it could be your own decisions. It it may not be. Maybe this has been put on you. But I want you to know today there is the God who prepares. And and, And the third group is this. If you've lost anything, Jesus is saying, I will gather up the fragments of those things that are lost. And it starts right here at the altar. We can ask God, God, I've lost my compassion. Or God, I've, I've I've lost this opportunity. Maybe you're living your life in regrets. I want you to know today he's saying you can gather up the fragments that are lost. So if you feel that you're unprepared, you're out of position, or you've experienced loss, today I'm calling you today to get on your feet with your shoes on and your belt tightened and your... Your staff raised up. Raise up your staff if that's you. Any of you, just raise up a staff. Let's close our eyes this morning. And let's just say, God, if anybody is here that's not prepared, out of position, or has experienced loss, and right now you want you want to step out and say, God, I want to get in position. It starts at the altar. It starts at the altar. Amen. Well, it looks like we're in position. I want to give you three things as we're closing. Look back at me. Three things to position yourself. You know, it says, I heard one Nigerian preacher, he says, if you plan to fail, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Part of getting in position and being prepared is having a plan. Habakkuk put himself in position, he had a plan. The first thing, begin to write down. Number one way you can be prepared and put yourself in position, write down the things that God's telling you. Write them down. Write the vision down. He told Habakkuk, write the vision down. Make it plain. When God speaks to you, write it down. Find a journal. Write down the things. This is positioning you. That's preparing you. When God's speaking to you, God's going to prepare you. Write down the things he shows you. Number two, have a plan. A plan for evangelism. You know, so many people, they want to be evangelists or they want to reach people or they want to have disciples. They want to have those that they brought to Christ. But they walk around without any plan. You should have a plan that if you come across somebody that's dealing with atheism, you have a plan how to bring the gospel in. If you come across somebody who is is struggling with with this particular issue or that issue or they've been hurt, have a plan how you're going to reach out. Have a plan in advance how you're going to bring the question to open up the gospel message. Have a plan for evangelism. Have a plan for your Bible reading. Come on, on version, man, we can just, bam, 
You can have a plan, and there's all kinds of plans out there. Have a plan for your Bible reading. That positions you. That prepares you. Have a plan for your quiet time. Mike Bickle, who does uh, International House of Prayer, what he was asked, how can I really make my prayer life important? He says, have a plan. How, how can I be better in my prayer life? Have a plan. Have a plan in advance. When you're going to pray and how you're going to pray and what you're going to pray. Put it down on a plan. Preparation. Prepare the way of the Lord. And the, and the third area is set some goals and objectives. Amen? These are things that are going to get you out of just reclining back with your shoes off and your belt open. And God's going to say, that's the one I can call to go. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to do what God called you to do? Let me pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, if there is anybody here in this group, God, that they are here today and they've, they are not prepared or they are out of position, God, I pray that you would touch their hearts right now and that you would speak to them, that they would be prepared for the day of your coming. Again, I'll ask if there's anybody in that situation, just begin to wave a hand at me. I see the hand. Okay, right now we're just, I, I see several hands, about three or four hands. We're going to pray together right now as a group. And I don't know whether it's because they're unprepared and they've never asked Jesus into their heart or they're out of position and they know they're not where they're supposed to be. But you know what? Right now we can pray. We can pray that shoes will be on the feet, belt will be tightened, and our staff in our hand to get ready and go and do what God called us to do. I want us to pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus. Repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I come to you today in faith. I know that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again. And I declare you Lord of my life. God, show me how I can prepare. God, help me to get in position. And launch me out, God, to do what you've called me to do. In Jesus' name we pray.